This is part two of the video on valence bond theory, a quantum mechanical theory of bonding. So in this video, we're going to look at how valence bond theory treats a multiple bond. So in some molecules, like carbon dioxide, for example, we have a double bond. So far, what we know about valence bond theory is that we need an unpaired electron in a, an orbital on an atom, and that's going to overlap with an orbital on another atom, a neighboring atom that it's bonded to, that also has an unpaired electron. So that might account for one of these bonds, but what about the other? Well, extending valence bond theory, what we're going to need to have is another set of orbitals that overlap. So we're have, going to have two different kinds of overlap, one for each bond. So here in a double bond, we're going to overlap one pair of orbitals to maybe give us this bond right here. And another pair of orbitals will give us this bond right here. So before we go much further, we need to learn a little bit about bond symmetry. So it turns out that we can classify, we chemists classify bonds based on the nature of the overlap. So we call that bond symmetry. So bonds have symmetry depending on the location of the overlap region with respect to the bond axis. Okay, what does that mean? Well, let's imagine that we have two atoms that are bonded together. So here's atom A, and it is bonded to atom B. So in the center of atom A, then, is the nucleus for atom A. That's right there. And in the center of atom B, there's the nucleus for atom B. That's right there. So the line that connects the nuclei of the atoms, so I just drew a little dashed line in here that runs through both nuclei of both atoms. That's what we call the bond axis. And so that's what we want to think about, the line that connects the atoms. And where is the overlap occurring? So the first kind of bond symmetry we call that sigma symmetry, and it's given this lowercase Greek letter sigma. And in that case, the overlap contains the bond axis. So for example, if we have two hydrogen 1s orbitals like this one. So there's one hydrogen atom. There's the nucleus in the middle. And here's another hydrogen atom. It's going to overlap. There's the nucleus in the middle. So the bond axis runs through the middle of the two molecules. And the overlap contains that bond axis. So it's almost like you've skewered or shish kebobbed um, these orbitals with that bond axis. So I call that end-to-end -end overlap because the end of one orbital is smooshed into the end of the other orb orbital. The second kind of symmetry we haven't seen yet, and it's called pi symmetry, so lowercase Greek letter pi. And in that case, the overlap density is on one side or the other of the bond axis. I say above and below, but it could be front back as well. So how would you get that? So imagine that we've got a different kind of situation now where we've got p orbitals. So um, here's a nucleus, and here's a p orbital. That might be a pz orbital on one atom. So here's atom A. And over here near it is atom B. So atom B also has a PZ orbital on it. And let's imagine that these PZ orbitals each had an unpaired electron. Well, what we can do now is let these orbitals overlap side to side. So this lobe on the right smooshes into this lobe on the left. And same thing down below. Now here's our bond axis, right? It goes right through the nuclei, that dashed line. So now we've got this side-to-side -side overlap going on. And we call that a pi bond, when there are two regions of overlap. Notice that even though there are two regions of overlap, above and below or front and back, this is only one bond, because we've got one orbital on A, a p orbital, that's overlapping with one orbital on B, another p orbital. So let's look at some examples. So here we have a molecule that's represented by this structure. So this would have the Lewis dot structure. And um, using our VSEPR theory, we can get the shape. So it's tetrahedral around both carbons. So it looks kind of like this in three dimensions. It looks kind of like this structure in three dimensions. So here's a ball and stick representation of that molecule. There's a surface that goes kind of all around this molecule, right? And this surface is kind of showing you where the electron cloud would lie. So the ball and stick model is on the inside. This other shape gives us an idea of what the molecule might actually look like if we could hold it in our hands or see it visually. So what we see here is that the uh, carbon right here, what hybrid orbital is it going to use? So to figure that out, remember we count the number of electron regions around the atom. In this case, there are four that I've just circled. So when there are four regions around a central atom, it's going to use an sp3 hybrid orbital. The same thing is going on over here for this carbon. It also uses an sp3 hybrid orbital. So remember, the sp3 hybrid orbitals look like these balloon shapes pointed to the corners of a regular tetrahedron. 
So the um, sp3 hybrid orbital on one carbon atom right here overlaps with the sp3 hybrid orbital on another carbon atom. So those guys are overlapping here in this region. Now the bond axis is going to be this dashed line that I'm drawing through the middle. Sorry about that. That I am drawing through the uh, middle of these nuclei. So there's the bond axis. And in this case, the overlap region, which is right here, I just circled it, is skewered or shish kebobbed by this bond axis. So we call that a sigma bond, and it's been labeled for you. So there's an example of a sigma bond. Now we're going to look at a case where we have a molecule with a double bond. So this is ethylene or ethene. And in this case, there's a double bond between the two carbon atoms. So how do we account for that bonding? Well, first, let's figure out what hybrid orbital this carbon right here is going to use. So it has one, two, three regions around it. Remember, a double bond counts as one region. So three regions around an atom means that we're using an sp2 hybrid orbital. So an sp2 hybrid orbital was formed from um, carbon having a 2s orbital. Then we have three of these p orbitals, the 2p orbitals. Here's the original electron configuration for carbon atoms, looking like this. And so what we do is we promote an electron, so there you go, up here to this orbital. And then we're going to hybridize, or mix, 1s orbital and 2p orbital. So I'm going to just put those in a box and say mix. So we mix those guys. So what we have is an sp2 hybrid orbital. But also note, and this is important, let me change my color here that now we have an unpaired electron in a p orbital, and we can use that to do some bonding. So that's what's pictured up here in this diagram. So here's a carbon atom with an sp2 hybrid orbital. Over here on the right, there's another sp2 hybrid orbital. Each one of those contains an unpaired electron. We overlap them, and we've made one of these two bonds between the carbon atoms. So that would be a sigma bond. So there's our sigma bond. We make other sigma bonds here to the, between the carbon and the hydrogen. So a hydrogen atom 1s orbital, right? the sphere comes up, and it overlaps with one of these lobes of the sp2 hybrid orbital. So that's made another bond. Now what's going on last, this p orbital is shown right here. So on um, this carbon atom, we have a unhybridized p orbital. It has two lobes, but there's only one electron in it. And it can overlap with the unhybridized p orbital on the neighboring carbon, like this. Now this is kind of a funky drawing, so it's kind of having to show this long distance overlap so we can smush them all in together. But you get the idea. So if this were smushed in much closer, you wouldn't be able to see the sigma bond so well. But these guys are overlapping side to side to create what is the second of these two covalent bonds. So that's how we make a double bond. So we overlap these orbitals right here, the sp2 hybrid orbitals. That makes one of our bonds. And then the overlap between these unhybridized p orbitals makes the second bond. Now I know in this picture it looks kind of like there are three bonds, but they're not. There's one bond here, the sigma bond. And then there's another bond that has two regions of overlap. And that's this pi bond up here. So there's a pi bond. So whenever you see a double bond, double bonds are made up of what? One sigma bond and one pi bond. Now we're going to look at one last um, case. And this is when we've got a triple bond. So this is acetylene. And so we've got a triple bond here between the uh, carbon's atoms. So we need to make that triple bond. So first, let's figure out what kind of hybrid orbital this carbon right here might use for bonding. So we've got two regions around that carbon atom. And when you have two regions, we're going to use an sp hybrid orbital. So again, let's think about our electron configuration. Here's the 2s orbital. Here are the 2p orbitals. Carbon has two electrons there and two electrons in the 2p. We are going to promote an electron up here. So we'll get rid of that guy. Then we're going to hybridize an s and a p. So now we've got an sp hybrid orbital here when we mix these guys together. And now we've got two unhybridized p orbitals that are right here, each with a single unpaired electron. Right? So each of these orbitals has a single unpaired electron. So that's how we're going to make our triple bond. So we can use one of these sp hybrid orbitals right here to bond to the hydrogen on one side. This can bond to the carbon on the other side. And then we can use these two to make the rest of our triple bond. And that's what's pictured up here. So let's look at this carbon right here. Here's one of the sp hybrid orbitals that has an unpaired electron in it. 
it can overlap with the sp hybrid orbital on the left hand carbon that also has an unpaired electron in it and that makes our sigma bond. Then we also have a p orbital that's here on the hydrogen atom, let's say that's the pz orbital on the carbon atom and it has an unpaired electron in it and it can overlap with the pz orbital on this neighboring carbon atom also has an unpaired electron in it. So there's our second pi bond. So there's our second bond, our first pi bond. Very good. And now we've got one more. You may not be able to see it so well, but it's right here. There's a p orbital that's coming out towards you, and then there's a p orbital that's back behind the plane back here. And those overlap side to side to give you the second pi bond. So there's a second pi bond here. So what is a triple bond? A triple bond is made up of one sigma bond plus two pi bonds. Here's a better picture that maybe shows you the pi bonds. Up here this is one pi bond. I've circled in red. This is one lobe of one pi bond. So that makes one pi bond. Top, bottom. And then front and back, so I'll kind of shade that in like this. Front and back is our second pi bond. So two pi bonds even though we've got two lobes for each pi bond. And here's a, a, an image, ball stick model, and surface drawing of what that molecule might look like. So uh, pi bonds do something interesting. And uh, what they do is they restrict rotation around a bond. So we're going to go back here a couple of slides, and we're going to look at um, ethane. So ethane right here, it turns out that um, there's no fixed orientation about this sigma bond. So we could take this CH3 group that's right here and we can kind of spin it around like it were a propeller. It does take a little bit of energy to do that, but there's pretty much free rotation. So um, this molecule right here, this CH3 group, can kind of spin around and adopt different shapes. So we can orient these hydrogens to these hydrogens differently just by spinning this bit like a propeller. So we call that free rotation. Now if we look at the case in uh, a pi bonded molecule, we would still be able to freely spin this overlapping orbital with this overlapping orbital. So imagine that you know you've got a fist inside your uh, cupped inside your hand. You can you're free to rotate that fist that's in, cupped inside your hand um, right and left. That's fine to do that. But what we can't do is rotate this pi bond because if we try to tilt this group this way, if we try to rotate it counterclockwise, what happens? Well, we have to break this bond right here so that we can spin these p orbitals so that they would be perpendicular to each other in order to move this chlorine around. So in order to spin this, we have to actually break a pi bond. And it takes a fair amount of energy to break a chemical bond. So we say that we have restricted rotation in pi bonded molecules. So it's not so easy to spin this chlorine group so it moves up here and takes the place of this hydrogen group. So you would actually have to break this pi bond here in order to do that. So in order to convert this molecule into this molecule. Therefore, these two structures that are drawn here are actually different molecules because we cannot freely convert between them. So this molecule that's over here on the left has different properties than the molecule on the right. So they have different boiling points, different melting points, and other properties that are different. Another interesting thing about these overlapping p orbitals is that if we have overlapping p orbitals, say on a molecule that is a long chain or a ring, then we can actually think about overlapping over the whole length of the molecule. So here I've drawn three oxygen atoms, so this is ozone that I'm looking at, and these are three unhybridized p orbitals on ozone. So these are pz orbitals on ozone. And if we imagine that there's an unpaired electron in each one of these, then what we can do is imagine that we overlap side to side along the length of the whole molecule. Now this pair of electrons is no longer confined to be right here between this first oxygen, oxygen number one, and oxygen number two, but in fact can move all through this region. So we call that delocalization because this pair of electrons is not localized in space. It doesn't have to be at one location. It can move around. So those electrons would be delocalized. And it turns out that whenever you can spread out charge, electric charge like this, it helps stabilize the molecules. So electron delocalization stabilizes molecules. It's also an interesting thing to make a connection here with resonance structures. So if we were to draw the Lewis dot structure for ozone, it would look like this. 
there's the Lewis dot structure for ozone, but we can draw a different resonance form for ozone where we put the double bond on the other side of this molecule, like that. So those are two resonance forms for ozone. Notice what it's saying is that the molecule, the real molecule, is a blend of having the double bond on the left and having the double bond on the right. But this picture with our uh, valence bond theory pictures actually shows that this is one continuous blending of having the double bond be kind of on both sides. So this actually shows us what we have to build in artificially with our Lewis dot structure. The theory kind of shows that to us. So we actually have electron delocalization because of that. Here's an example of a benzene molecule. And in this case, we've got an unhybridized p orbital on each carbon atom that goes around the ring in a benzene molecule. Here's a Lewis dot structure for a benzene molecule. So benzene is C6H6. And it has this cyclic ring structure. So there, uh, we would draw the Lewis dot structure with alternating double and single bonds. But we could draw a different resonance form where the double bonds and the single bonds sort of switch places. The real molecule is a blending of those two structures where we delocalize those pi electrons all the way around the ring. So these pi electrons then are free to move around this ring wherever they would like. So imagine that we've got two donuts, one sitting on top of the plane of the ring and another donut sitting on the bottom. And these electrons are then free to move anywhere inside these donuts. So we've spread them out over this whole structure, delocalize that. And that's why benzene, it turns out, is a little bit extra stable. So you may want to know, how do we know that this is correct? Well, in some sense, we can actually see or visualize this with a particular kind of experiment. So this is an AFM, which stands for Atomic Force Microscopy. It's a technique that's also related to something called scanning tunneling microscopy. So those are uh, very similar approaches. And so this is an image of a molecule called pentacene. So this is pentacene down here. Pentacene is made up of what looks like five benzene rings all fused together. And so this is a flat molecule, kind of looks like a caterpillar that's been squished. So it's a flat molecule. So what this technique does is actually lets us go in and image the electron density. So we get kind of bright spots where the electron density is high. I'll show you how that technique works in a second. But this is actually the experimental microscopic image of this pentacene molecule that's been put down on a metal uh, substrate, probably platinum. And so you can clearly see the uh, five ring structures here. And more or less, the electron density seems evenly spread out around the molecule. Now, for uh, particular reasons, these ends end up with a little bit more electron density on them than what it looks like here in the middle sections. But um, more or less, it looks like the picture that we've shown here, where we've got these pi electron clouds that are delocalized over the whole molecule. Here's a slightly different picture that shows you pentacene and the way the experiment is done. The way this experiment is done is we take a microscopic tip, usually gold. And in this case, we have the tip um, capped with a carbon monoxide molecule. So there's a particular technique for doing that. And what we do is we put a high voltage on this tip. And then we use a very special technique to move it very, very small, short distances over our substrate. And as this tip gets close to the tops of these molecules, so where their electrons are close, there's a chance that an electron can hop between the tip and the molecule. And when that happens, we measure a small electric current. And so that lets us image where the electron density is high, because that increases the probability that an electron will hop. So that's what's shown here in red, high probability of electron hopping. And you see that it images this molecule very well. And it looks a lot like this picture that we just saw with the delocalized rings. So that's the valence bond theory treatment of a sigma and pi bonds and how we treat multiple bonding in um, valence bond theory.